the circumstances under which you meet Mr. Putin the very first time? Well, it was December of 1999. It was uh, literally about two weeks before he took over as acting president when Yeltsin resigned. At that point, he was the uh, prime minister under President Yeltsin. And I was at that point the acting secretary of state for Russia and Europe. And I went with Strobe Talbot, deputy secretary, for a meeting with Prime Minister Putin. Uh, and this was not Strobe's first meeting, but my first meeting with him. And uh, I was struck by how disciplined he is, uh, how really unemotional, uh, well-prepared, and smart as an inter interlocutor, he seemed. But uh, that was the meeting at which I discovered for the first time that there were certain issues which are kind of hot-button issues for Putin. And in this particular case, the hot-button issue was Georgia. We had had for maybe a half an hour kind of normal meeting in which we went through the agenda in a kind of routine way. Uh, until we got to Georgia, and at that point we were uh, raising the issue of Chechen fighters, fighters that the Russians were fighting against in Chechnya, who were kind of uh, running away from the Russians and finding sanctuary in Georgian territory. And we tried to explain what we had heard from Georgian President Chevardnadze about what the Georgians were doing to prevent those Chechen fighters from escaping into Georgian territory. And as we described uh, what we had heard from the Georgians, from Shevardnadze, we could see Putin's face just start to redden a little bit. And he leaned forward in his chair just very, very slightly and interrupted us and said uh, in Russian, Vash drug Shevardnadze balbies, your friend Shevardnadze is a fool. And then he proceeded in circumstantial detail to explain why he thought Shevardnadze was a fool. And it was as, as though the temperature in the room dropped five or 10 degrees in the space of about two or three minutes. Uh, and in the meetings that I had with Putin after that, uh, including with President Clinton, in which we talked about the same subject, we saw the same reaction. Uh, that Putin had a very strong, visceral, anti-Georgian feel uh, to his view of what Russia's rights and privileges were. What does that tell you about him? Uh, that he's a man who sees the collapse of the Soviet Union as a great loss for Russia. That countries uh, which used to be in the Russian orbit were lost and perhaps irretrievably lost. And also, in his view, that the United States played an active role in working to distance countries like Georgia, like Ukraine, like the Baltic states from Russia. You were the enemy in some ways. Is that too harsh? Uh, well, I think he talked about the United States as an adversary in uh, his uh, famous speech in Munich in uh, 2007. Uh, he made it very, very clear that uh, he saw the West and the United States in particular as uh, countries which viewed Russia uh, as a threat and that they were setting themselves out essentially to make things more difficult for Russia. When he, when he, uh, when uh, uh, Yeltsin gives that horrible speech on New Year's Eve where he's yeah, right, which we, which we saw on the last night of excerpts of. Exactly. So th there it is. It's devastating. Yeah. Uh, what did you make of what did you make of what Yeltsin was saying, uh, where things stood, and the on the moment that uh, Putin was about to take over? Well, he really illustrated uh, in a very kind of personal and sad way a lot of the decline that Russians themselves had felt their country experience over the preceding eight, ten years. Uh, Yeltsin, who had many, many good qualities and who, I think, in his bones was a Democrat, uh, lacked, at the end of the day, the the force and the forcefulness to really see his agenda through because of a lot of his own uh, personal and physical frailties. And those were on, I think, vivid display that night. And uh, I think for a lot of us who had been dealing with Russia for a long time, 
uh, and had had very high hopes when the Soviet Union fell apart and uh, independent Russia led by a democratic force like Boris Yeltsin had emerged on the stage, uh, had some hopes that this could be something sustained through the changes that needed to be made in Russia. Uh, but it was clear that Yeltsin wasn't the person who was going to see those changes through. And I don't think any of us really at that time thought that Vladimir Putin was the one who was going to see those changes through. We, many of us, so I certainly saw Yeltsin as another in a series of uh, transitional temporary figures who had obviously populated the prime ministerial seat under Yeltsin, but now might only be there for a short time as president. And that obviously would have much more profound implications for the direction of Russia. It wasn't so much that we feared Putin would take Russia in a wrong place. We felt that Putin maybe wouldn't last and would be succeeded by some hardliners who really saw the West as an enemy, who really saw the Soviet Union as something that needed to be reconstituted and reconstituted fast. Were you surprised at how Putin took it, uh, how fast he took it, the way he took it, what happened under uh, President Putin? Well, I think it was really remarkable to see him step up to the responsibilities of that job in the way that he did, in the serious way uh, that he evidenced very early on. Remember, when he became uh, acting president after Yeltsin resigned, he had a three or four month period in which he was literally running for the presidency against some token opposition because Yeltsin had uh, sort of sanctified him as the heir apparent and there, it was clear that he was going to become the president, but he had to show himself, uh, he had to show his presidential medal, uh, metal uh, in that, uh, at that point. And in the interactions that he had with the Russian people in the program, the sort of manifesto that he put forward at that time, I, I think he, uh, at least to my eye, he showed himself to be much more capable than some of the more disposable prime ministers who had come before him. How about the harsh things, the sense of, uh, when did that make itself uh, uh, apparent that he, that he was gonna be a strong man? Uh, I think uh, in the meeting he had, uh, the roundtable he had with the Russian oligarchs in uh, 2000, in which he essentially laid down the law and said, there's a new sheriff in town. Uh, the old rules no longer apply. Uh, you've all made a tremendous amount of money over the last 10 years, uh, and no one is going to challenge you on that, uh, regardless of how you might have made it. Uh, but you have to stay out of politics and you have to pay your taxes. As long as you do those two things, we're not going to go back and uh, have a, a truth squad or, or restitution effort. Uh, and uh, it was clear enough that he meant it that a couple of the oligarchs whom he had sort of singled out uh, as maybe already not playing by those new, new rules, Boris Berezovsky and Vladimir Gusinsky, uh, pretty quickly decided that it was time for them to leave the country. In fact, I think Kuczynski was maybe even briefly jailed for a while. These were both media barons who controlled the media. And in doing that, Putin made clear not only that the, all of the oligarchs had to play by new rules, but that oligarchic control of the media, especially the broadcast media, which is how most Russians get their news, was no longer going to be outsourced. This was going to be uh, a state-run operation, and it's remained that way throughout Yeltsin's term. How did you feel? I mean, if I was if I was standing there in your perch and saying, and seeing this new guy come in, and suddenly the media, especially the media, is one of the first things that he takes control of. That feels like a giant step backwards. And uh, it didn't happen all at once. There were stages to it. There was a Russian television network called NTV, which under Yeltsin had been really the voice of opposition uh, and had gotten Russians used to the new circumstances of actually hearing their leaders criticized on the nightly news. Uh, I think it was pretty clear that uh, Putin was not going to continue with that, which in the eyes of even many Russians had uh, 
uh, gone a bit too far. This is a conservative country that's not used to dealing with these sorts of freedoms, and people can be easily convinced in Russia that these freedoms are actually turning into license and that they're injurious to the country. And that's what Putin sought to do, but he was also helped by circumstances. There was the terrible terrorist attack on the Nordost, the theater in Russia, in Moscow, in 2002. Over 100 Russian theater goers were killed when they pumped fentanyl gas into the theater. And uh, Putin used the media coverage on NTV in particular of the siege of that theater uh, to tighten the screws, shut down even more of the freedom in NTV. And it was really at that point, I think, that uh, it was clear that NTV, as it had existed up to that point, an alternative voice uh, against the line coming out of the Kremlin, was going to be gone. And once Russia lost an independent NTV, it became a, a different country. In what way? Uh, it was a country uh, which, in which uh, you, you simply didn't have the media speaking truth to power anymore. It became a, the country it had been uh, before the Soviet Union fell apart, in which the media existed to serve the views, the agenda, the program of the party or the government. Uh, were you there when President Bush came in and looked him in the eye? Yeah, I was actually in uh, Ljubljana. That was uh, July of 2001, maybe June. Uh, and that was uh, an interesting meeting from a lot of perspectives, actually. Uh, it was the first meeting that the two had had. And I remember, because we briefed President Bush going in on what he was going to be facing, the usual kind of pre-brief, uh, and I remember being struck by both, uh, by how both President Bush and President Putin seemed almost a little bit nervous as they had their initial encounter in front of the press before they went off to have their one-on-one -on -one meeting, which was scheduled as one-on-one -on -one meetings always are for a half an hour, 45 minutes. Uh, knowing that they'll usually run longer, you never want them to end before their uh, appointed time. Uh, so off they went, and I wasn't in that meeting. Uh, I went into the meeting with Colin Powell and the then Russian Foreign Minister Igor Ivanov. Uh, and a half hour stretched to 45 minutes, to an hour, to an hour and a half. And by that point, Foreign Minister Ivanov was looking at his watch and saying, Have, is there a possibility that they've left? Uh, maybe somebody just forgot to come and get us. And Colin Powell said, no, I'm sure that when the time comes. Uh, and that actually was a fascinating conversation for another time because both men kind of ran out of talking points and just started talking more directly about how they saw the world. Fascinating conversation, but <laughs> with uh, Igor Ivanov always a bit worried that something was happening in another room that he didn't uh, exactly have a, a handle on. Well, eventually, obviously, they came and got us and brought us to what was supposed to have been a large format meeting for about an hour. And as we sat down, both President Bush and President Putin looked extremely relaxed. It was striking how different uh, they both acted after that, what we now know was a very long, uh, detailed and personal encounter that they'd had in the one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, they both said, well, this meeting can only take about 15 minutes because we've covered all the main subjects in the small meeting. And so we basically, I think, just had some small talk or a few of the other people around the table spoke up. And then we went off to get ready for the press availability, uh, which was held outside on a platform. We briefed uh, President Bush, uh, went over what we had already written for him to, to say. Uh, but then obviously after he made that statement in which he described the good meeting that they'd had and in circumstantial detail what they'd talked about, uh, he was asked in the first question, I think, what is your view of President uh, Putin? And he said what he said. Uh, what did he say? He said, uh, I looked into his eyes and I got a sense of his soul. Uh, and in that meeting, as we know, President Putin had told President Bush the famous story about the time his dacha burned down in Leningrad or St. Petersburg, 
uh, and a religious medallion which had belonged to his mother, I believe, which had gotten lost, and he thought this was irretrievably gone, and then a fireman brought him this kind of almost like a holy relic, uh, which it was a very affecting emotional story uh, and had some effect on President Bush because I think that is part of what led President Bush to say, I got a sense of who this guy is. I got a, a, a bit of a look at his soul. Uh, as we heard that sitting on the podium behind, uh, I mean, we all realized at the time uh, that this would be something that we would have to uh, explain or, or uh, the president uh, would be questioned about this. But in fact, uh, if you look at uh, what the results of that meeting were in another three or four months after 9-11, uh, you can argue that the bond that President Bush formed with President Putin at that point allowed President Putin or gave President Putin the confidence to overrule his advisors about a week after 9-11, uh, all of whom were telling him almost unanimously not to allow the Americans to establish temporary bases in Central Asia for their inevitable attack on Afghanistan, the source of the 9-11 attacks, because the Americans would never leave. And Putin overruled those advisors, saying, no, from what I've heard from George Bush, I think the more important thing is helping the Americans in their fight against the Taliban, in their fight against al-Qaeda, and we'll deal with the basis question later. So President Bush rightly and, uh, you know, and I think justifiably was able to say that uh, his bonding with Putin in that meeting in Ljubljana actually paid dividends for the United States after the 9-11 attacks in a way that might not have happened had uh, they not had that meeting. Uh, Putin calls within an hour. They, the way the story goes, he's the first person who gets through to President Bush. Yeah, he doesn't actually talk to President Bush. I think he, he no one was actually getting through to the president. I believe he talked to Condi Rice, but uh, he uh, immediately did reach out and he uh, knew that American forces would be going on extremely high alert at that point. And the playbook said that when the American forces go on high alert, Russian forces go on high alert. And he was calling essentially to say, that's the playbook, but we're throwing that out. That's not what we need to do to help you right now. So when your forces go up, ours will kind of stand down and, in fact, will cancel an exercise that we had scheduled. Not an insignificant gesture by the Russian president at that well, moment. This is my question. When you step back and you look at, at uh, almost every interaction uh, President Putin has with new presidents of the United States, there's a sort of honeymoon period, maybe there always is with everybody new, uh, but then it, it, it sort of doesn't work out that way for w one reason or another. From the American perspective, from the president's perspective, from what you saw, uh, what happened to the relationship between President Bush and uh, uh, President Putin? What happened uh, in the next two or three years? What were the moments that really counted uh, uh, where, at least the way it looks from outside, uh, things uh, get colder? Well, a couple of things. The withdrawal from the EBM treaty uh, without a lot of notice to the Russians and uh, Putin uh, accepted that and they made the best of the American withdrawal from a long-standing arms control treaty which had been part of the fabric of deterrence that had kept uh, the two superpowers from going to nuclear war. Uh, the Russians weren't happy about that, and Putin, I think, in that saw a bit of the unilateral approach to foreign affairs that would come to characterize uh, President Bush and, and certainly the way Vice President Cheney and Defense Secretary Rumsfeld viewed uh, America's interests and ways of protecting and projecting America's interests. Uh, and obviously leading into the uh, invasion of Iraq and the Iraq War, which the Russians uh, openly sided with the French and Germans in opposing, not joining the coalition of the willing along with uh, the UK and others. Uh, this, and this was all happening against the backdrop of a remarkable reversal of fortune in Russia. 
because of the price of oil, which between 2000 and 2008 uh, just about quadrupled. And in the process, the disposable income of the average Russian tripled almost. And as that happened, it gave Putin and the people around him a sense of confidence that uh, they weren't back on their heels anymore, that they were able to pay off their uh, foreign sovereign debt, which had been a looming problem for them for a while. And in time, it came to give them what I think was a misplaced confidence that they really didn't need the West anymore, that they were doing fine on their own, playing by their own rules. And in fact, uh, among some, it came to be seen as an article of faith that not only didn't Russia not only did Russia not need the West anymore, but really the West was responsible for the problems that still existed in Russia and in Russia's nearest neighborhood. The Orange Revolution, uh, the Rose Revolution in Ukraine and uh, Georgia, respectively, uh, both were seen inside of Russia and by Putin directly as an American attempt to weaken Russia's sphere of influence, sphere of privileged interests in what they called the near abroad, uh, which they, Putin, the Siloviki surrounded him, saw as their natural sphere of influence. In fact, we, we the EU and uh, NATO certainly had encroached, uh, moved in pretty closely over the years since uh, the wall came down. Was he kind of right about some of that? Was well, NATO and NATO enlargement played a role in that uh, as well. But uh, NATO enlargement was not something at the time that Russia opposed. It certainly wasn't opposed. Much of it happened under Yeltsin, obviously. But the second wave of enlargement took place to the Baltic states, former Soviet territory, to Bulgaria, one of Russia's closest uh, allies. Uh, that happened uh, under Putin's watch and. It was, at the, at the time it happened, not strongly protested against. This has become the narrative ex post facto more than at the time. 2007, well, we kind of did Munich. Let's do Munich. So what is, what is happening with him when he takes the stage in Munich? What does he say? What is the American perspective on it uh, as he says it? Well, uh, what he said in Munich was, I think, essentially uh, kind of the culmination of what I described earlier as that growing sense of confidence in Russia's ability to manage its own affairs according to its own rules, not being, uh, I want to use the word vassal because I heard it several times last night from Putin, but uh, it's not the word he would have used then, uh, that Russia at that point was no longer uh, going to be mentored by the United States and really didn't see uh, the West and the U.S. as any kind of even a democratic model. He was beginning to expound his view of the exceptionalism of Russia as a kind of eureka, uh, unique Eurasian civilization, not a derivative of a Western civilization. Uh, and this was something that was not really unexpected or anything that's very different. Uh, Russian history is uh, replete with examples of uh, internal arguments between westernizers and uh, Slavophiles or uh, hardliners, whatever you want to call them, those who don't see Russia's future tied up in any kind of greater uh, relationship with the West or the United States. Uh, so Putin in that aspect wasn't really propounding anything new or different, but he was clearly setting himself on one side of an argument that's been going on in Russia for centuries about what the future of that country is, which direction it will go. Uh, what I thought was interesting was the response of the United States government uh, as a uh, represented by Secretary of uh, Defense Gates, who was there at that time. Uh, who And I was not in Munich for that, so I was watching this from the sidelines. But uh, Secretary Gates, who knows Russia uh, as well as anyone in the U.S. government, uh, simply said, let's not rise to the bait here. Uh, 
and his response in Munich, which isn't remembered anywhere nearly as well as Putin's, was itself a kind of masterpiece of diplo diplomatic deflection. Uh, essentially, Gates said, uh, if you want to try to arrogate to yourself a leading role in the Eurasian sphere, knock yourselves out. Go ahead. Uh, but don't expect any support from the United States and expect to have opposition from the U.S. and the West when you cross lines, when you infringe on sovereignty, when you uh, break international agreements that you've taken on yourself. So what happens with Georgia? Well, uh, it was interesting. When I went to Moscow uh, as ambassador in 2008, I got there about a month before the Georgian War broke out. Uh, that uh, was in early August. I arrived uh, just around the 4th of July. And my initial round of meetings with Russian officials that I had, the foreign minister, uh, Putin's foreign policy advisors, Medvedev's foreign policy advisors, because Medvedev was president at that point. I had a sense that this feeling that the Russians were uh, enunciating, what we had heard at Munich, I really felt on the ground in Moscow. And I came back, and I remember a meeting I had with Dan Fried, who was the assistant secretary of state for Europe. And I said, I. I've never really felt that place spoiling for a fight the way I feel it right now. And this was a month before uh, the actual fighting started in Georgia. But it was very, very clear that the Russians were fed up with uh, Saakashvili, the president of Georgia, who was, they felt, pushing against their sovereign rights, their sphere of influence that they had the right to control. And they were obviously very, very concerned that the Bush administration was moving towards allowing both Georgia and Ukraine to get into NATO, which was for them a huge red line. It really probably didn't need to be. That's a different argument. Uh, so the conditions were in place for a clash. And it was almost as though uh, the Georgian leadership kind of almost blundered into this, not realizing that the Russians would do, would respond with, uh, with force in the way that they did. Uh, it was very clear to us in the summer leading up to August of 2008 uh, that the Russians were prepared uh, to, to pick a fight. They were uh, doing overflights of Georgian territory. Uh, there were other probes and sorties and diplomatic pricks that made it clear that this was maybe not the time for the Georgians to do anything rash. Uh, and we weren't uh, Saakashvili about this. Uh, but uh, the war broke out. That's a, a very, very long seminar on exactly who shot first, who started. Uh, but once the Russian forces came across the border, uh, it was clear that the order of the day was to get them to stop before they got to Tbilisi. And there was no guarantee in early August that uh, Russian forces would not simply continue into Tbilisi. They were having a rough fight, but they certainly had superiority of numbers uh, in personnel terms uh, to do that. But uh, obviously a diplomatic effort was undertaken by Sarkozy, led by the French. The United States took a uh, part in that, and the fighting was stopped, uh, but not, at, uh, not without the, the uh, recognition of the two disputed territories, South Ossetia and uh, Abkhazia, without the recognition of them as independent countries by Russia. Uh, and that was a game changer because that was really the first time uh, that n territory belonging to a sovereign neighbor of Russia, which had been recognized as part of that sovereign neighbor by Russia up to that point, suddenly changed. Uh, there were other disputed areas in Russia, but the two in Georgia uh, and the unilateral recognition of their independence by Russia uh, 
uh, made it clear that Russia would go to some lengths to make clear its view that it still needed to control what happened in those countries. In a way, it was a harbinger of what happened several years later in Crimea. How did President Bush, how did Steve Hadley, how did, how did they react to what happened? There? Well, you have to remember this was at the end, very end of the Bush administration. We had a presidential campaign underway between candidates Obama and McCain. Uh, and there was, uh, there was a lot of discussion within the Bush administration about sanctions aimed at Russia in response for what they had done in Georgia. Uh, but in the end, uh, I think the clock kind of ran out on getting those put together and approved by the Europeans because it was very clear, I wouldn't say approved, but signed on to by the Europeans because it was very clear to all of us that unilateral American sanctions at that point, that the Europeans did not join, wouldn't have any effect, did enough of a desired effect on Russia, in particular at a time when it, uh, an outgoing administration has much less of an ability to make a bold, strong push in that way than a new administration or even an administration in the middle of its term. So uh, essentially, uh, there were, there w it was a lot of discussion of uh, pretty wide-ranging economic sanctions, uh, but in the end, the decision was made to help Georgia as much as possible bolster its own defense so that we could at least draw a line where the line had stopped and make sure the Russians didn't go any further. So, so President Bush, who began his relationship with Mr. Putin, you know, looking at his soul, uh, by the end, what's his opinion of uh, President Putin? Uh, frustration, uh, and I think a sense, as many American presidents have had, that the hope that they came into office with to build some kind of different, more productive uh, relationship with Russia uh, turned out to be much more difficult to sustain uh, than, than they had thought. Uh, and this was not unique to President Bush. I think uh, just about every of the last four presidents has come into office saying he wanted to build a better relationship with Russia. Um, certainly President Clinton uh, felt disappointed at the end of his administration. President Bush and President Obama all felt disappointed. That's why I, I have a sense of deja vu when I heard President Bush come in, uh, when I heard President uh, Trump come into office saying he also wanted to build a more productive and constructive relationship uh, because the track record hasn't been good. From your view, uh, having witnessed what happened during the Bush years, uh, how different was Putin than you expected him to be? I think Putin uh, evolved and hardened over the time that uh, President Bush was in office. And uh, as I said, I think a lot of this had to do with the economic, the reversal of fortune that happened uh, when President Putin was presiding over a government which wasn't only solvent, it was able to raise pensions, uh, there was much more money for education, health care, certainly for defense, a country which really had been uh, headed toward uh, second tier status, uh, looked suddenly again to have some pretensions to being a superpower. And that gave Putin and the people around him uh, a lot of confidence that they could push back against what they saw as the kind of overweening confidence and even arrogance of the United States. I'm not saying that that's a justified view, but that certainly was their view. Uh, and they felt themselves, for the first time, uniquely placed to be able to act on that because they had the resources to back it up. So. Barack Obama wins the presidency. Hillary Clinton is the Secretary of State. Um, it's reset time. Uh, are you, obviously, they ask you, they talk to you, what should we think about Putin? What should we do about Putin? What's the state of play in Russia? What do you say then? Well, when uh, Obama came in uh, as president, 
uh, I think there were two or three circumstances which made it more likely that we were going to be able to turn a page uh, and uh, get beyond what had really kind of become a rancorous relationship in the tail end of the Bush administration uh, and begin to get some cooperation out of Russia on issues that answered our own interests, uh, specifically uh, Iran uh, and its nuclear ambitions. Uh, and I think the circumstances were first the fact that we had a new president, uh, which always allows the Russian side to visit all the sins of the past on the outgoing administration and, and really look at what looks like a cleaner page with the new administration. And we were dealing with a different Russian leadership as well. We, you asked about President Putin, but we were in fact dealing with President Medvedev at that point. Yes, Prime Minister Putin was certainly calling a lot of the shots from that prime ministerial seat, but the vis-a-vis -vis for Barack Obama was Dmitry Medvedev. So those two things were uh, probably setting the stage for the possibility of a better relationship. But what really made the difference was the economic situation because in 2008 and especially by 2009, the bottom had dropped out of the global economy and Russia was hit worse than I think any other emerging economy. The ruble lost 30% of its value, inflation spiked up, uh, the Russian stock market had a couple of sickening plunges in which a lot of capital was lost. Uh, and suddenly, as the Russian leadership looked around, uh, they realized that this perception of Russia as sitting on top of the world, controlling its own fate, and being uh, resource rich, suddenly looked a bit more shaky. And as happens periodically in Russian history, when that happens, Russia realizes that it has some ground to make up, that there are some, some gaps and some lags. And uh, they traditionally, historically, in those periods have tended to look to the West for support in helping them fill some of the gaps. Whether or not that means that Russia has changed its worldview, that strategically it sees itself uh, better served by a closer relationship with the West, is a different question. But tactically, it opens up many possibilities for American businesses to do more in Russia, for the United States and Russia to be able to talk more seriously about Russia. Finally joining the World Trade Organization, which had been a long-standing failed effort on the part of both countries. Uh, so I think the economic downturn, 2008-2009, was really the key to opening up something that looked more like a productive uh, and constructive dialogue with Russia than we'd had in the past. But did you really think Putin was gone? He had clearly decided not to change the Constitution or violate the Constitution by standing for a third term election, which was prohibited, two consecutive terms only. Uh, and he had found a good stand-in in Dmitry Medvedev. And the question for us in the Obama administration was, how much can we get done in this new circumstance with a different Russian president who has a slightly more pro-Western worldview than Mr. Putin did, uh, and who also forged uh, a pretty good personal relationship with President Obama. They had a lot of similarities. Same generation, both uh, former law professors, families, you know, approximate size, same, uh, same ages. Uh, so there was some hope that it was at least productive to try to move things forward. And you never go into this with illusions that you're going to get a lot of things done because uh, the, the weight of history and experience shows you how hard that can be. Uh, but you never want to look back and say, we didn't try hard enough. And in fact, in that set of circumstances, with a new American and Russian president, with Russia feeling back on its heels a bit more economically, we were able, in fairly short order, to renegotiate uh, a new strategic arms re reduction treaty. Russia agreed to lower, and America agreed to lower the nuclear uh, 
uh, levels on both sides and to reestablish the uh, verification regime that had uh, kind of atrophied during that time. So this was a, a major accomplishment for American interests, uh, not to mention what we were able to negotiate with the Russians vis-a-vis -vis supply of our forces in Afghanistan through Russian territory. We actually had American planes flying across Russia, refueling at a Russian airfield, carrying American troops and materiel into Afghanistan, a pretty remarkable uh, state of affairs, which, which assumed uh, extremely uh, high importance after the killing of Osama bin Laden when we found it very difficult to bring things in through Pakistan for a time. So again, there were definite accomplishments which answered American interests in the reset. Uh, as we said, the problem is always, how do you make this last? Right. Especially in the face of things that began to happen, the other revolutions, the, the finally, ultimately, Arab Spring, uh, many, it feels like, destabilizing influences where soon Putin himself is, uh, is not liking the way it's all lining up. We never really saw Putin and Medvedev clash over a foreign policy issue in public until Libya until the UN Security Council resolution which authorized the use of force in Libya, which Russia, at President Medvedev's instruction, abstained on. And it was only a matter of hours, I think, until President Putin found his way to a microphone to announce to the Russian people and to the world why he thought that was a mistake, why he saw the West on another crusade against uh, an Islamic country in the Middle East, and by implication, not a direct criticism, but by implication that Dmitry Medvedev had made a mistake by uh, abstaining and not vetoing that resolution. And within, uh, I would say, less than a day, President Medvedev went back on television in his own way, defending what he had done, essentially uh, implicitly criticizing Prime Minister Putin's criticism of him. That was the moment at which it became pretty clear, I think, to many of us watching Russia and wondering about the succession dance that had been going on, that uh, Medvedev was probably not going to be asked to uh, serve a second term as president. What made you think that? What was it? It was it. What made you think that? Uh, it, it just that uh, and a number of other things made it clear that uh, it seemed as though Putin did not have uh, the confidence that Medvedev would hold the line against what he saw as American Western encroachment on Russia's interests uh, in the way that he himself, Vladimir Putin, had already shown, demonstrated, that he would stand up against. It's that big to him. It's that palpable. It's that real that we're the opposing force. This is the way not only Vladimir Putin, many Russians were brought up and trained to see the United States and the West as the unalterable ideological foe, antagonist of the Soviet Union and, by extension, Russia. Uh, the way you are brought up, the way you are trained has uh, a very long-term effect on your Weltanschau. There's a, another kind of countervailing force and energy that seems to be happening in 2011, uh, I guess, and that's the, pr the protests that rise up, some motivated by the force of the web, the force of Facebook, the force of Mr. Navalny and others. Uh, take me there. Explain well, I think a, a lot of that really came out uh, literally onto the streets after uh, Putin and made, uh, Medvedev made their joint appearance uh, in early fall of uh, 2011, uh, announcing that Putin, in fact, would stand for another term as president and that uh, Medvedev would become prime minister, and in essence, that they would swap jobs. Uh, Medvedev himself, uh, in the uh, 
immediate aftermath of that, and even at the event it itself, uh, it appeared to many of us that uh, you know, he didn't feel completely comfortable with this, or certainly the way that it had been rolled out. But more importantly, we started to hear and feel from the Russians we had contact with, from what we were seeing in social media. This was a time at which blogs and uh, Twitter were just kind of in their infancy, but still a vehicle for people to express themselves, and especially a younger generation of Putins. We began to feel something that we described, I think even in cables back to Washington, as Putin fatigue, that the prospect of another four or six year term with President Putin uh, was something that a number of Russians uh, had strong feelings against. And we saw that begin to play out on the streets of Russia after the parliamentary elections in December, which uh, I think by almost any objective measure were uh, tampered with. Uh, there was some evidence of fraud there. And uh, the Russian people reacted to that by going out into the streets with signs that said, literally, President Putin must go. Uh, this was quite extraordinary in uh, the history and experience of a lot of us dealing with Russia to see that level of opposition played out on the streets without a corresponding show of force. The December protests, the famous Bolotnaya Square protests, were not put down with any significant uh, violence on the part of the authorities. They kind of played themselves out. Uh, in a way that was striking to all of us uh, longtime watchers of Russia who really wondered how long can this situation go on. Uh, it did not seem at all likely to us that President Putin was going to allow that state of affairs to continue on for very long. And of course, uh, as a first order of business, uh, he had to find someone who was responsible for the outrage of people carrying signs in the street calling for him to step down and he found that in uh, Secretary of State Clinton, who had given a speech a day or two earlier in which she criticized the fact that the elections uh, had been tampered with and that uh, the Russian people were perhaps in their rights to go out on the street and, and protest against that. And of course, that kind of gave Putin all the ammunition he needed to blame her for sending those people out on the street in the first place. And from that point, things spiraled downward uh, and, fairly and, steadily. And how intensely spiral? What, describe the spiral for me, will you? Well, that, uh, co now we're getting to the point where I actually left. I left Moscow in January of 2012. Um, so it was pretty clear to me that uh, having heard Putin directly accuse Hillary Clinton of inciting people onto the street against him, uh, having heard my counterparts in the Russian Foreign Ministry began to question the activities of the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, which had done a lot of different projects in various spheres in Russia for a long time. But suddenly I began to hear uh, questions about how much longer Russia would allow USAID, USAID to work inside its country. Uh, because in their view, it was USAID which was supporting and even funding a lot of these opposition uh, NGOs, uh, various other organizations, which were spearheading the movement against Putin. So the storm clouds were starting to gather uh, by December and January of uh, December 2011 and January of 2012. Was there a relationship between <clears throat> Hillary Clinton and Putin at the very beginning and the reset, what was her attitude towards him and what was the sort of interpersonal? Well, the, the, the challenge throughout the Obama administration, and throughout certainly the reset, was how do you maintain a relationship with Vladimir Putin, who is uh, a very influential and consequential figure, in Russia, some would say even more influential and consequential than the president, uh, but not signal in establishing and carrying on that 
relationship with him that you're somehow diminishing the stature of the sitting president, Dmitry Medvedev, who was the natural vis-a-vis. Uh, so we sort of set out to do that by finding the right interlocutors for Putin that he uh, would accept and who we could use to move the conversation forward and to also get a sense of where he was on key issues like uh, Iranian sanctions, uh, like support for WTO accession by Russia. Uh, Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, was a big part of that because the Secretary of State would almost always meet with the Russian President and Prime Minister when he or she would come to Moscow. This goes back to Madeleine Albright days. So a, a good uh, channel of communications there. Obviously, President Putin uh, met, uh, sorry, President Obama met with Putin as Prime Minister when he came for his summit meeting in 2009 with Dmitry Medvedev. Uh, Vice President Biden came to Moscow in 2011 for extensive talks with Prime Minister Putin at that point, uh, always with the aim of keeping lines of communication into these two powerful men uh, whose own relationship uh, wasn't completely transparent to us. So we were, in effect, trying to hedge our bets there, always obviously realizing that it was more likely than not that Putin would come back as president, but never wanting to undermine Dmitry Medvedev because he was in a position to make decisions and do things furthering our interests in a way that we wanted to take advantage of. Were you there when Hillary met uh, uh, um, Putin? Yeah, Prime Minister Putin? Sure. Uh, How was it, what was it like between the two of them? Putin is a very, demanding interlocutor. He uh, sizes his uh, meeting mates up pretty quickly. Uh, and he's uh, the kind of guy who really is capable of holding forth for 40, 45 minutes uh, in great data-laden detail without notes. Uh, and your ability to have an effective conversation with him depends on your ability to listen, sometimes for a long time, to these kind of filibusters almost, and to take mental notes and to respond to each of the points that he's raised, uh, many of which demand to be challenged, uh, in a way that doesn't miss anything and shows him that you are a serious person uh, and commands a bit of respect. And uh, Hillary Clinton did that as well as any American leader that I ever sat in with on a meeting with Putin. Uh, legal training, obviously, a lot of experience at the top levels of U.S. government, very sharp mind. And Putin had a lot of respect for her professional abilities. He obviously uh, didn't like the things that she said about Russia. Uh, there was a bit of going to be an ideological confrontation there because Hillary Clinton was never going to concede that Russia had a sphere of influence in its neighboring countries in a way that Putin was always seeking to hear from his American interlocutors. So I think that was probably some of the source of what turned out to be a bit of friction between them because they were very evenly matched in terms of uh, intellectual capacity uh, and uh, I would just say nimbleness at the table, which is kind of art uh, that develops among the best in the business uh, in these kinds of encounters. In the uh, December 2011, when he's, you know, so critical of her, mm -hmm. he sees her, well, what is her response? How? How are you hearing about what uh, Putin and the Russian government think about it? What's that moment like? It was pretty tense. Uh, they were uh, very unhappy about the speech that she gave in uh, Vilnius, Lithuania, in which she directly criticized the conduct of the election and, by implication, called into question the legitimacy of the ruling party, United Russia's hold on power uh, in Russia. Uh, that was, a, from the Russian perspective, from the point of view of the Kremlin, the foreign ministry, a bridge too far. 
uh, and a very, very sore point because she had a point. Because, in fact, uh, Russian voters, especially in the larger cities, St. Petersburg and Moscow, had shown uh, that they did not support united Russia. And by implication, they were expressing a vote of no confidence in Vladimir Putin to a certain degree. Uh, not a majority, but a strong minority. Uh, and that was uh, something that uh, rankled. And when the American side criticized it, it, that criticism had to be answered. Did it, did it feel to you like a momentous allegation on his part, like this is something that's not going to go away? No, it actually wasn't unprecedented. Uh, I mean, it was unprecedented in the personalization that Hillary Clinton was named. But we'd heard this for years, that the Americans were inciting Russians to express themselves in ways that the Russian government uh, didn't feel was right. Uh, so this was really nothing new. But the personalization against Hillary Clinton, I think, was, was something new and obviously would make it difficult uh, for her and uh, Putin to be able to have productive meetings. Why and do you think? Why do you think he did it? Why her? Uh, because it was an accusation that needed to be answered, and she had put herself on the record, and rightly so, in Vilnius uh, the day before, calling out the Russian government for the conduct of the elections. She was the one who gave voice to that, and. So she was the one who took the brunt of their forceful response. I really want to follow just on this point. <clears throat> All the way up until those 2011 protests, there really had not been any domestic protests. And I wondered um, yeah, there, yeah, there had been, actually. Actually, there, there were, you know, we in Moscow, we were watching this pretty closely because I think I mentioned that after the joint appearance by Medvedev and Putin, we started to feel and see, pick up in social media in particular, uh, this uh, sense of Putin fatigue. Uh, right. uh, and this actually played itself out in public, uh, I recall, I think in October of 2011 at, of all things, a boxing match in Moscow that for some reason Putin appeared at and went into the ring to make some sort of statement. Uh, and he was loudly booed by the boxing fans in the uh, arena uh, in a way which was quite striking. Uh, and it was, I think, just an indication that they'd kind of set him up in the wrong way. And the cover story that came out was that the uh, boxing fans had just seen a long match and they had not, they'd been drinking a lot of beer and they hadn't been able to take a rest break. Uh, and then when uh, Prime Minister candidate President Putin came out to make a statement, when they thought they were finally going to be able to get up and go to the bathroom, then uh, that's the boos were occasioned by that, not by any enmity towards sure, uh, sure, Putin sure. himself. <laughs> John, I, I grant you that. But what I'm saying, I wanted to know is, did you ever hear from Putin in the earlier years, prior to 2011, this paranoia that CIA rules the world, the color revolutions are being directed by America? Did he sort of keep that to himself? Or in private, did he... Did you know that he felt that way? Oh, no, no, no. I, we knew it because uh, we uh, would, uh, even back in the early years of Putin's presidency, during the war, uh, the civil war that they were fighting in Chechnya, uh, there was a lot of criticism and direct protest from the Russian side about American interference in supporting the Chechen rebels. Uh, because we, at that point, this is the Bush administration, were criticizing Russia's conduct of the war, which uh, occasioned a lot of needless civilian casualties and violations of human rights uh, that we, the Bush administration, felt con uh, absolutely unconstrained about speaking out against. Uh, and Putin came back at us very directly in a couple of occasions, uh, he actually accused individuals in the State Department of conspiring with named Chechen officials uh, 
to support them in the fight war that they were uh, engaged in against Russia. Uh, and this was uh, quite often tied to actions by the U.S. security services, by the CIA in particular. Again, this, this was in large part uh, exaggerated, if not wholly made up, but again, uh, very strongly believed by Putin. How different is the guy that, that, that comes in in 2012 than the man that you had been dealing with? I think he was, he was different because he had uh, had time and occasion to really kind of form a new ideology, uh, an ideology uh, with a Russia-dominated Eurasia at its core. And remember, as he came back in as president, his main project, what we saw at the time as his legacy project, was creation of what he called the Eurasian Economic Union, which would be a kind of counterpart to the European Union, uh, economically based and including most of the states of the former Soviet Union, including and importantly including Ukraine, whose economic heft would be central to the importance of anything like that. Uh, this was part of Putin's way, again, of siding with those on the Russian side who were not willing to see the West as any kind of a model or a mentor or even a sustainable partner for Russia, that Russia simply would have to play by its own rules in its own sphere of influence and not really worry too much about what the West or the rest of the world said or thought about it. When you left, looking in your crystal ball, uh, what did you what did you think the near future held as uh, problems? What, where was Russia headed? Where were we in Russia headed? Um, what was the road ahead? Well, I I think it was I mean it was very clear just uh, almost tactically immediately that uh, the Russians were going to expel uh, USAID from the country. They had kind of signaled that, made it very clear, and there was not a whole lot that we could do about that. Uh, the question, I think, really, uh, the larger question was uh, Russia, under Putin in a third term now, is acting in a way that really doesn't pay attention as much to the opprobrium of the West, to sanctions, to criticism from the Europeans or the Americans. What does it take if the chips really begin to fall for us to prevent the Russians from moving into the Baltic states or into Ukraine? Uh, and uh, obviously, I think a lot of that concern uh, was validated by what we saw happen in 2014. I, I'm going to skip Ukraine because I, th uh, yeah, really, because I, you know, I'm it's not out of thing. government at that point. Um, a worried onlooker. A worried onlooker. Tell me what that means. <laughs> uh, how can you not be a worried onlooker when you see Russia break the rules of the post-war compact uh, in such a conspicuous and indefensible way? Why would they be angry about Putin? Well, there's a kind of unwritten compact that got established in the early 2000s uh, between the Kremlin and the Russian people, uh, which said to them, look, you can see that your disposable incomes are rising in a way you can measure pretty easily year by year by year. You're living better and having more money than you ever had before. Pensions are rising. So you let us take care of the political side of things, uh, and we'll guarantee you a continued rising standard of living and, oh, by the way, all of these personal freedoms that uh, your parents didn't have, the freedom to travel, the freedom to uh, watch Dojt TV or uh, go on the Internet, browse anything you want to do, uh, go to churches. Uh, we're not going to pry into your private lives anymore uh, and your economic well-being we will look after, but let us take care of the politics. By 
2010, 2011, as the air went out of the Russian economic bubble in connection with the global depression, uh, recession, uh, that deal suddenly seemed to a lot of Russians less ironclad than it had just a couple of years earlier. And they blame Putin? Um, they, some of them would blame Putin. And uh, I think that's part of the reason why uh, the levying of economic sanctions against Russia in an unfortunate way plays into a narrative on the part of the Russian leadership that it's not our own economic mismanagement, it's not our own corruption which is responsible for the stagnation of the Russian economy. It's our enemies in the West who are sanctioning us and trying to weaken us. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, standards of living are not going to grow as quickly as they had in the you know, recent years, but you can't blame us for that. Somebody else is responsible for that. And it, it gives uh, Putin and the people in the Kremlin around him uh, more of an excuse and more of an out uh, for having to deal with the real causes of Russia's economic uh, stagnation. Let me ask you this. Now we're moving forward. It's the spring, <coughs> summer of 15, spring of 16, and the, and the hacking has happened. The, it's starting to come out. The intelligence services know about it. People are beginning to know and say that it's Russia. What do you think when you hear this? Uh, I think that there's practically no doubt that the capabilities that Russia has would be and were used in this way to try to influence, to try to play inside the American electoral space. And it was done, I think, not specifically at the beginning with the goal of electing one candidate or disadvantaging another candidate. I think it was more likely green-lighted as an effort to simply show that what the Russians see as interference in their own electoral processes over the years by the United States is a game that two can play at. Is that what Putin wants? I think that's certainly what he wanted to uh, do, what the powers that be in Russia were seeking to do, to undermine what they see as a kind of arrogant expression of American superiority as the leading democratic country. It rankles many, many people in Russia when they hear America described as the leader of the free world, the democratic beacon that others look to. Uh, they see this in a very zero-sum way, that uh, any extra greatness that accrues to Russia somehow, uh, that accrues to the United States, somehow comes at their expense. And if they're in the position to take the United States down a notch internationally so that uh, other countries question uh, you know, our ability to manage an electoral process, so much the better for them. Putin will win out of this, or is he lost? Well, I think strategically, uh, you know, Putin ha has lost on a lot of fronts, actually, uh, in strategic terms. If you look at Russia's long-term interests over the next uh, 10 to 15 to 20 years, uh, is it in Russia's interest to have alienated a whole generation of Ukrainians uh, who now see Russia as an enemy? Uh, this is a country that Russia had always had a, a much more uh, congenial, almost familial relationship with, although there were tensions between Russians and Ukrainians. Uh, the enmity towards Russia now in Ukraine is striking and certainly is not in Russia's strategic interest. Is it in Russia's strategic interest to have reawakened NATO in the way that, uh, that it has after the uh, annexation of Crimea? after the fighting in the Donbass? Uh, probably not. Uh, NATO had moved on from seeing Russia as a threat, uh, was looking at a lot of other out-of-area uh, problems for it to deal with. Uh, now Russia has put itself back uh, almost at the center of the bullseye uh, in a way that I don't think is in Russia's long-term interests. So uh, 
no, I, w I wouldn't think that Putin really has won any victories here. And I think certainly also the interference, the attempt to interfere in the American election uh, also has caused a lot of people to look at Russia in a much more different and uh, negative way in the United States than was the case six to ten months ago. That also can't be in Russia's interests. Does it feel to you like we're in a kind of war with them, and not a shooting war, not a, but a, but a different kind of disruptive, chaotic, permanent? No, nothing's permanent. <laughs> Nothing, okay, semi-permanent. No, there's no struggle. there's no permanence in uh, U.S.-Russia relations. Uh, um, I wouldn't call it a war at all, and I certainly wouldn't call it a new Cold War. Uh, Russia you know, doesn't approach the level of uh, you know, ideological purity and allegiance that it commanded when it was the other superpower as the Soviet Union. Uh, but it is a country with tremendous reach and tremendous resources that we need to continually try to find a way to have fighting with us rather than against us. And right now it does feel like Russia is fighting more against us sometimes than, uh, than with us. But uh, again, I don't see that as a, a permanent state of affairs. Okay. All right. Thank you, thank um, you. On that note, sure.